Hello students, this session is a lecture on the poem Ode to Autumn by John Keats. In all his odes, Keats shows his extreme sensitiveness to the beauty of things. In Ode to a Nightingale, he is enchanted by the beauty of the bird song and in his ecstasy finds himself transported to the romantic land of beauty and joy created by the song of the nightingale. For him, nature gives him peace and beauty which are denied to him in human life, which is full of the weariness, the fever, and the fret. Kitz's love of beauty is manifest in the sensitive and sensuous evocation of beautiful pictures of autumn in his famous poem, Ode to Autumn. He draws one after another the lovely and colorful sights of nature and captures its various sounds. He shows natural phenomena in concrete human forms and images. This is such as a Greek poet might have longed to do. Kitts loves nature for her own sake. Nature for him is a storehouse of beauty. Autumn appears as a season of mellow fruitfulness, of serene, ripened beauty. In the first stanza of the poem, the poet describes the fruitfulness of autumn. Autumn is a season of growth and ripeness. Plentiful fruits, flowers, are produced in the season. The vines, the apples, the goads and the hazels all show abundance. Spring and summer are over, yet the flowers continue to blossom. It seems that the flowers of autumn are the special gifts for the honey bees. These bees gather honey all through the warm days of spring and summer, but they still suck honey from the late flowers of autumn. The cells of their hives overbrim with honey. They are led to think that the happy days of summer will never come to an end. Thus, the fruitfulness and ripeness of autumn are presented through sensuous and concrete images. There is plentifulness and fertility everywhere. However, ripeness is also a prelude to death. And there is the suggestion of tragic destiny for the season, which is gradually approaching towards winter, the season of decay and death. The bounty and maturity of the natural products also carry a sense of impending dissolution and destruction. But the poet is not disturbed by the thought of the barren winter that will soon follow. He is content with his present happiness. In the second stanza, autumn is at first embodied in the figure of a reaper at his work. The reaper has fallen asleep in course of his reaping. He is lulled to sleep by the intoxication of poppy flowers that have grown in the field. He has not completed his task. A row of corn stands half reaped before him. His scythe lies idle in his hand. A bundle of ripe corn is before him. It is intertwined with poppy flowers. It seems that the reaper has ceased from cutting those because he has fallen asleep. Autumn is conceived here as a reaper and harvester. Yet she is a harvester that is not harvesting. She is motionless. She is seen sitting careless on the floor of the granary. Secondly, she is found asleep on a half-ripped furrow after the morning's work. But the movement begins in the latter part of the stanza. She is seen carrying the load of grains on her head, balancing herself as she crosses a brook. And then she appears as a cider presser, patiently watching the cider press at work. Thus, autumn is active and yet motionless. The living personifications of autumn as harvester, as a reaper, and as a cider presser are exactly in the manner of employing concrete images by the ancient Greek poets. A picture of calm repose 
and serene tranquility is presented in the expressions sitting careless, sound asleep, drowsed, and hour by hour. It captures the sloth, lingering, and almost idle mood of the season. Autumn is a season which is not alarmed or panicked by the impending winter. It can afford to relax quietly and carelessly like the harvester, the reaper, and the cider presser who neglect their duties to enjoy the beauty of the season. In the third and last stanza, Kitts speaks of the music of autumn. Autumn's music is in tune with the spirit of the season. It is heard at sunset in the humming of the small gnats. These gnats hover among the willows which have grown by the side of a river. The beating of their wings produce a plaintive melody. Full-grown lambs shout from their folds upon the hill. The high-pitched notes of hedge crickets are also heard in autumn. The soft, shrill whistle of a red breast from some neighboring orchard is also a characteristic song of autumn. Lastly, there is the twittering of the swallows, which is already heard during sunset. The swallows are about to migrate to some other countries now that the summer is over. These soft, gentle, and sad sounds make up the composite music of autumn. A sense of sadness and melancholy apparently ling rings in the last stanza. The thought of the fast approaching winter with the death and decay of nature is present in the picture of the soft dying day during sunset. But the mood of sadness merges with the optimistic feeling of continuous life of nature which eternally renews itself in insects, animals and birds. The poetry of earth is never dead. It continues in the eternal cycle of seasons and of death, life and regeneration in the world of nature. The music of autumn is feeble when compared with the vibrant sonority of the songs of spring. The full-grown lambs bleating from the hilly boundary, the grasshopper singing and the robin whistling from the garden croft are images of life that stand out sharply against the melancholy austerity of late autumn. The twitter of the swallows gathering in the sky for migration is a sharp reminder of the advent of winter. But the image also achieves a sense of continuous renewal of life through insects, animals and birds. What is impressive about the poem is its inclusive vision. It incorporates in its compass both the rich abundance of the season and the inescapable fate of change that causes decay and destruction. Thus, the poem celebrates both the fulfillment and the process of change. The poem achieves a unique union of progression and stasis. Each of the three stanzas concentrates on a dominant, even archetypal aspect of autumn, but while doing so, admits and absorbs its opposite. Thus, there is the resolution of the opposites in the poem. It enshrines the Shakespearean vision contained in the magic words, rightness is all.